Okay. How does this sound now? <sighs> okay. Alright, um... Well then I guess... It is time to start. Shit. <clears throat> Hang on, let me, uh, I gotta link myself in the... Oh, fuck, that's annoying as shit. Procaster is always on top of things now, so, like, it's forever above everything that I, you know, need to look at. Unless I minimize it, which I shouldn't have to. Okay, um... I think I'm gonna let people roll in here first before I start for reals. Um... <coughs> let's see, uh... Is anybody using Psy or no? That, hopefully. Okay, um, who all here has Psy? Because that's, that's important for this portion, I guess, at least. <coughs> Does everyone have the Anta brush pack? Because I can link that real quick too. And again, the uh, Anta pack is uh, only for Psy. Like, I'm sure you could use the textures for, for Photoshop and stuff, but... Okay, one sec. Um, onto brush pack. That's the one I'm using right now. <coughs> it's pretty good. I mean, there's there's a couple other ones you could find somewhere, I'm sure, but this one has quite a 
few good uh, textures and things and brushes as well <coughs> I guess uh, starting off with Psy tutorial. Um. Well, is there anything that anybody would like to know about um, Psy? I guess I can start off with that. Otherwise, I just um, I think I'll run through. Um. So <laughs> what does it stand for? That I don't know. Some. Japanese thingy. <coughs> I don't know, it's a Japanese program. Open Canvas was at least a little more uh, self explanatory. Dildos with transparency. How do you mean? first start a file inside you're gonna it's gonna um be uh, it's gonna have a transparent background so like first thing you do like uh, you saw me do here I filled the um canvas in with a color because otherwise all of my uh, my drawings would just be uh, fully transparent all the way through because uh, that's it like it's a little more well it's easier to see on Photoshop because they have that uh gray and white checker background so you know when you know there is absolutely no uh you know color and it's transparent straight through um but for Psy there's really no way to tell so you got to make sure it's kind of shitty you got to make sure and check that your your um underneath everything if you want a background that you have a background. <coughs> oh, yeah, that's what that's what Psy are. That's what Psy is are? I don't know. But it's all caps. S A I. I don't know if that's the same deal. But uh anyways so um, I guess start off with uh, your brush tools, maybe. I'll start off with pencil, I guess. Uh, I like how much of a rundown do you want? Of like, do you want me to go in depth on fucking density and everything, or just go over the different tools I use? too, I guess. Um, I'll just draw a quick something or other. And I guess I'll go over how I use tools for it. Something. Um... Well, at least you're honest. <laughs> okay, uh, first thing is, uh, your sketching tool, whichever it is, uh, brush or pencil, this being a brush, being painting, and, uh, Pencil being more solid. Uh, whichever you use, I'd recommend uh, having a lower density right here because density is your, your transparency. So 100% density. You can have full solid lines. 
only 50% of the color remains, you know, and you get less. And it stacks up on top of each other when you go back and forth. But, um, usually I like drawing with around, like, maybe 60, 70, so that my lines aren't always completely solid every time. <coughs> I'll just do it real quick. I don't know who this is going to be. Uh, I was thinking Lyra. I'm not sure exactly how to do her hair. Isn't it like this, kind of, sort of? Um, now, uh, as far as tools for drawing go, uh, right then, just so far, I've only used the, uh, the brush or the pencil, whichever you want, and I used the eraser, which is both really standard things. Um, but for now, after I did my initial sketch, you know, I'm gonna wanna check and make sure that this is exactly how I want it and uh, you have a few ways of doing that um the most important one I think is the canvas flip which flips your canvas horizontally and uh, it gives you a fresh perspective on you know your drawing so that you you can correct any mistakes because sometimes uh, it's at least for me I mostly notice it with uh, drawing the eyes in that um, they may not be correctly spaced from this, you know, the center of the face, or they may not be correctly uh, level with each other across the face. And um, the canvas flip, um, if you see right up here along your top bar, right here it says normal, um, and that little uh, left and right arrow thing uh, right next to the stabilizer, if you click that, it flips your canvas horizontally. So now we get a different look at Lyra and it looks like this eye right here is actually kind of thin and could stand to be a little bit wider up top there. And it's a little lower than this one is right here. So we can correct that as well. And uh, if you want a, a hotkey or shortcut for the canvas flip by default, in Psy it is uh, just the H key, so you tap H and you can get it to flip again. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the, the horizontal flip is very, very good for noticing um, errors in symmetry, which if you draw something one way it's kind of hard to see it from the opposite direction. That's a very handy tool. Um, what's next? I guess we can go on to inking her, which I usually do in a new layer. Cause it doesn't make sense to draw on the same layer. Um, and over here, the opacity uh, is the opacity bar is 100% because she's uh, fully, you know, opaque right now. But um, I usually bring that down so that it's somewhat lighter and I can draw on top of it. <clears throat> and now, uh, also, if you want to draw a really uh, good set, if you want to utilize, I guess, the size of your canvas, uh, now is the time to, to size, uh, size her up because if I go through and I ink her right now, 
and then, oh, I decide I want to make her as big as the canvas, then you're going to get some artifacts and it's going to look shitty. So, uh, the sketch is the best time to um, make her uh, bigger on the canvas. And to um, change her size, by default it's uh, Control T for transform, or I think edit, no, layer, where is it? Hmm. There it is. Layer transform. I usually use hotkeys because they're infinitely easier. Unless you remember where everything is in the menu. Okay, that looks about good. Also, a neat thing with the transform tool is um, <coughs> you, by uh, default, you, with, without any modifier keys, without holding shift or control or anything, hello. Um, without holding shift or anything, uh, you know, you get the, the free free square transform, which you can squish or squash or whatever. Um, but there's also um, these little uh, points right here. If you hold control over one of those points, you can see that your, uh, your cursor changes. And if you grab that, it allows you to warp the uh, transform tool to allow you to skew things if you so desire. Also, if you grab it from the side, it allows you to drag the entire side. Yes, there is actually. Let me go over that real quick. And, um,. <clears throat> Alright, here, let me bring her up again. Uh, <clears throat> yes, those keys work. Um, also, hang on. Let's see, let me see. Um, those are nice for, uh, th those hotkeys are nice for stepping through these right here. Um, you see here's your brush sizes. Um, the bracket keys, square bracket keys, they step through uh, left and right, step through these sizes. So, you know, those are the standard uh, sizes for size. 10, 12, 14, 16, and then it goes by 5s and 10s. Um, if you want a free transform for your uh, brush tool though, uh, it's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite hotkeys is uh, you hold control and you hold alt and then this little bar appears and that 14 right there is my current brush size uh... you can touch click and drag along this bar and that will increase it but that only goes up to 100 which is uh... part of the size settings but if you want to go beyond that you click outside of there and you can drag to have it as big as you want so if you want a huge brush and then a tiny brush you can do it in on the fly like that. Very, very, very handy. <coughs> and uh, as far as uh, another one goes is Alt Shift. If you hold or no, sorry, Alt Space. If you hold Alt Space, you get this um, little uh, curved arrow right here. That's actually the rotate tool which you uh, click and drag and you can free rotate and you let go and it, you can, it helps a whole lot for uh, getting angles that you normally can't just by you know twisting your, your wrist so it makes things a lot more natural like you're turning a piece of paper um, I'm sorry but I forgot the reset the, the rotation reset tool but because I, I set that to tab for myself because I find it easier to have it on my left hand. It was one of the, uh, it was either like, uh, home, no, either home or insert, page up, page down, one of those. Those kind of control your, your rotations. What's that? Delete and end. Turn it that way. Page up and down. Zoom. 
home home resets everything so if you're zoomed in all the way and you're turned that like that if you press home it'll get you out to uh, the standard size shit hang on gotta get some new music in here Um, is there any other, uh, to, uh, tools, stuff you'd like to know about? Because I really would like to cover as much as people need. Um, shoot. Oh yeah. Um, really helpful ones that I use are uh, fill, fill, and clear, which uh, <clears throat> you can use to quickly, be, you know, manipulate your drawing area. Uh, fill fills in your current selection. Right now, I have no selection right here. No, no dotted marching ant lines going around so uh, if you hit control F by default control F that fills everything and uh, if you want to clear an entire layer you press just plain old D and that clears everything in that selection um, one thing you might want to watch out for be very careful is uh, hitting F just plain old F because for some fucking reason, I don't know why this is in th here. Like, if you watch on my layers right now, I'm on layer 2, and there's layer 1. If you uh, if you select layer 2, you press F, it moves everything within layer 2 down to layer 1, but keeps layer 2. So it's kind of like merging the layers, but it just, like, shifts all the content down. And, like, if you hit that and you're halfway through and you don't notice you could seriously fuck up your picture bad so uh, I don't actually I don't know why I have that on here anymore let me remove it uh, you go to others keyboard shortcuts and where is it F transfer down like that's fucking I don't even know why that's there and uh, to set hotkeys, you click on the, uh, the key that you want. And right now, uh, Shift, Control, and Alt are not selected. So this is just plain old pressing the key. <coughs> and so, like you see right here, D, this clear layer. You, c I'm going to set this to None. So I select F right here, and I click None, and it gets rid of that. And you didn't miss a lot, Cosmo. I'm just going over psi things. I've been going over real basic stuff. <clears throat> okay, so save that. And I can tap F all day and it doesn't do damn thing, which I don't know why I didn't do that sooner. But anyways, okay. Um, Another one that I use a lot is the lasso tool which the lasso tool is like a free form selection because um r right here are your selection tools you got um marquee selection it's called in photoshop where you select a, a square area like this and you know it creates the selection and then you can move whatever's in the selection um the lasso tool is a freehand one so let's say i want to edit only her eye draw around that and then you can select and do whatever <coughs> with that and okay uh, each selection tool has uh, its own 
uh, settings. Like um, this this area right here. Oh wait, hang on, I forgot to do it again. Da, da, da. There we go. This is what the standard thing is on Psi, so hopefully that wasn't confusing you. You can um, you can mod that under Window. Uh, show Layer Panel to the right, and show Tool and Color Panel to the right. You know, if you like your workspace. That That's more like Photoshop standards, I think. And you have your layers on the right. It doesn't really matter too much to me, though. Um, so this area right here, beneath, beneath your, your tools right here, and your color, color wheel, um, is uh, context sensitive, and that it changes depending on which tool you have. So you'll see that area change a lot. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the lasso tool, the really, really the only sections I, or um, properties it has is aliasing or anti-aliasing, which means, um, right now if I don't have anti-aliasing checked, which means when I grab a selection and I move it, it is going to have a very very hard edge like MS Paint tool type edge and if I check anti-aliasing it will smooth that out so if you want exact down to the pixel selections uncheck anti-aliasing <coughs> The selection tool and um, with Psy, yeah, everything is uh, moddable. You can change your your hotkeys to anything you want. And uh, tool, like tools in Photoshop, like I think B is brush. You know, B is brush, E is eraser. Um, I like to have the uh, lasso tool on L, which um, means if I'm in in sketch brush right here if I'm in another tool and I tap L and I switch to the uh, I switch to the lasso immediately and I can then use it but um another handy thing is if you want to use that tool but then uh, you don't want to switch to it permanently uh, all you have to do is press and hold it one second Um, so if I'm on the brush tool right now, if I press and hold L, it switches to lasso, you see it right there, and I'm still holding L right now, and if I let go, I switch back to my brush tool, and I can use that. And uh, also with selections, the fill and clear work with selections as well. So right now, I have the whole image here, but I just have this area selected. If you control F, that fills it, D clears it, and um, if you want to deselect, which means you want to go back to everything, uh, all you do is hit control D, and that will pull you out of there. So now I can draw in everything instead of just in that small area. And with selections, to manipulate a selection, let's say I let's say I select her eyes only. So I'm gonna get those real quick. And I decided I want to edit everything but her eyes. So right now. Um, I'm editing her eyes. If you go into the selection menu up here and you hit invert, that will change, it, it'll flip what you have selected to the complete opposite. So right now I'm selecting everything but her eyes, which can be useful for uh, 
I'll show you later in um, filling in when you're coloring. Um, another one is what else is there? Increment. I'll go over that in a sec. Um, oh, and transforming works with selections as well. So let's say I have her ear selected and I want to edit her ear. You can control T to edit that and it just edits the selection that you had. Which actually kind of needs to be a little more like that. To be honest. <clears throat> okay. Um. Hmm. What's next? Hmm. Okay. I guess I'll go through the other stuff that I use real quick. Um, for inking, more ponies? Well, I'm gonna call it ponies for a sec. Um, oh, always, I'm doing something bad. Always label your layers, because you never know when your picture is going to turn into a massive ordeal, and you could have 100 or so layers. If you don't label anything, then uh, you're gonna have problems. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, oh yeah, uh, folders. Folders are real handy for organizing layers. Right here, if you click that, you make a new folder, and let's call it uh, sketch stuff. And all you do is you click and drag. In, uh, the, the little uh, magenta outline will show you that it's going to go into the folder and you drop and it'll go in there. Um, the handy thing about folders is that um, if I move oh shit had a little emergency there so I froze. Okay, um, if I move stuff around in my document. I can do it by moving the layer itself right here. Or you can click on the layer, I, I mean the folder, and then it'll move all of the contents within the folder in unison, which if you need to move multiple things around that's very handy. Um, and also the opacity applies to everything. Um, you can't see it too great right now. Me. Okay, so um, here's the stuff within the folder. You can change the opacity for that. Yes, you missed the horse poops tutorial, unfortunately. Sorry. And it wasn't recorded either. So that changes the opacity of everything. Or you can grab things within here and just change the opacity within the folders. <coughs> okay, now I'm gonna do inking nonsense. Um, for inking, uh, usually I like to use uh, something that's solid, which would could be um, the regular standard pencil tool, um, opacity set to 100, or density set to 100, so that when you draw, you're only drawing thick, you know, completely opaque lines. Otherwise, you're going to end up with, you know, you make a line here, you make a line here, you're going to end up with lots of these little blotchy areas. And it gets, it's not so bad when you're on like 80%, but it's still somewhat noticeable. Um, so I usually just set it to 100 to take care of things. Also, um, for the pencil tool, and not for uh, any other tool I don't think, uh, you have uh, tip shapes or edge shapes right here. Um, this, this square, it's perfectly square, or not perfectly square, perfectly hard edge which will imitate Photoshop's hard edge brush. It's not MS Paint style, but it is very, very uh, uh, solid edge. 
and then the further you move along down the line, the more uh, fuzzy the edges get to the point you have what looks like an airbrush over there. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, no, I'm using, are, are you using Sci? Semi? Because I, this is only for Sci, unfortunately. Okay, awesome. Um, well, um, do you have the Anta brush pack, is the question. Okie dokie. Well, here it is. Um. Uh. It says in the instructions for the brush pack to make a backup for Psy, which is insanely easy. You just copy the Psy folder and call it like Psy Original or something. Um. I've been working in Psy for. Uh. Two years? But I've been working in Photoshop for like nine. But like all of my Photoshop knowledge has since um, atrophied after using Psy because Psy is very <laughs> Psy is so much better for drawing, I think, as as a drawing tool than Photoshop is. So Photoshop is like a yes, all drawing. I've been drawing for like uh, fifteen years, but uh. Um, drawing in Photoshop is not, I don't know, I find it harder because Photoshop is like, you know, it's a great program, but it, it, it does everything, is the thing, and Psy is geared specifically towards um, drawing and painting with tablets, so <clears throat> it's, I, I think it's a fantastic program. <laughs> Why not? You should start drawing. Everybody should start drawing. That's what these tutorial videos are for. So you can start drawing. <laughs> okay. Um. And uh, semi. If you go into uh, Sci in your tools right here, you notice these uh, blank squares. If you right-click in them a little uh, thing comes up and it, it'll give you the option to make a new uh, make a new tool and you know uh, it depends on the versions of Psy I've seen uh, the tools called different things um, but uh, I think s pencil, airbrush, and eraser are pretty much standard <coughs> so uh, pencil creates the new pencil tool right here which is a uh, hard no I guess it's 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 solid is what it is in that you don't really have a whole lot of it, do, it doesn't blend is the thing uh, pencils don't blend uh, whereas brushes do um, also if you really want to get into if you really want to get into it with uh, e editing your tools, um, the advanced settings right here are very handy for uh, getting the tool down to exactly what you want. Uh, to be honest, I am not entirely sure what the difference in this quality thing is right here, smoothest to fastest. I've messed with it and I haven't noticed a difference. Um, edge hardness. Well, that's you know hardness of the edge pretty specific um right here press it actually stands for pressure which is your pressure sensitivity um if you have size checked that means uh the size of the brush is dependent upon your pressure sensitivity so harder you press the bigger wider the brush gets um if you have density that one's pretty handy if you want to get a very soft kind of a painty look to your stuff um, you have max density when you're pressing which um, you know if I'm pressing all the way it draws at 100% density yes tapered edges that's what um, size 
pressure sensitivity is good for. Um, can't. <laughs> I don't know, why are you? And you can't see it too great since I'm at 100% density up here. Or, wait, no. Yeah, let me switch it down. What the fuck? Anyways. So let me turn my density down. You can see the density, uh, pressure density right there. The lighter you draw, the lighter it is. The harder you draw, the more dense it is. <coughs> I, uh, I tend to use that one more for brushes than I do for pencils. So usually I just have the um, pencil be dependent upon the size. And now, um, this hard to soft thing, can you go over high low pressure? Ah, you mean like the hard slash soft one? Or no? I'm not too sure what I, I get what you mean. <clears throat> hard and soft, okay. Um, this right here, the hard and soft meter right here, 100 is uh, exactly in the center. If you turn it up to 200, it's, uh, you know, all the way to the soft side, so you have, you know, Jesus, I hate, I hate that, to be honest. You have soft, and then the hard is on the left. Um, what that means is how quickly size tools respond to your pressure sensitivity. In that, um, 100 is the medium, you know, so you get a nice kind of a, t a, t a taper as I press. Like, um, I'm going to... I'm going to apply the same amount of pressure with each stroke as I do. So here's the middle. You know, I apply more and it, it tapers from uh, thin to wide. And here I'm going to apply the same amount of pressure at the same points. And it gets a very drastic, um, it, uh, pre your, your pressure sensitivity affects it immediately when it's on soft. And if I go all the way to hard, press real you know it, it, it doesn't it takes a lot more pressure to um, apply the pressure sensitivity settings which right here I have for size so um, 100 is the medium and pretty much just change it to whatever works best for you I've haven't honestly messed with it too much and I've been happy with having it set directly in the middle. <coughs> and that's that. Also, uh, brush shapes. Right here, this area right here, right under density. It says simple circle with no texture as a standard. That is your uh, brush shape and your brush texture right here. Simple circle. If I make a single dot there, it's a circle. Uh, but if you switch, you know, this is the shape of the brush. Let me do fuzzy static, which, you know, it's kind of like a speckled type of a deal. Noise is like a finer version of that speckle. Spread is more like a splotchy kind of a paint type of a deal. Um, those are the standards, fuzzy static, noise, and spread. All these things, Anta, 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 are from the Anta brush pack. Um, and just basically play around with it and figure out which ones do what and which ones you like. Uh, like me, for sketching on this brush over here, I pick a square edge. So I use uh, Anta rectangle, which you can see, instead of drawing a, a, a circle, it draws like a, a wide line. And I like that because it's for as for a brush, it's very solid, and uh, it makes for some like if you're drawing uh, rounded figures with uh, like a hard edge of a brush, like a square brush, 
honestly to me I think it looks more interesting. That's just a sort of personal preference type of deal. But um also yeah, that's my blocky sketching thing that I do, and I think Crooked Trees does it, I think a couple other people do it, that I've noticed. But, um, also, let's get your eraser tool right here. You can do the same thing for your eraser. Like right here, I have my sketch brush set to onto rectangle, and I also have my sketch erase set to onto rectangle, so I get the same effect erasing as I do from sketching. So it's kinda uniform that way. Um what was I gonna go over now? Okay, uh right here. Uh right next to your texture. Like let's say I have fuzzy static. I turn the density down a little bit. That's my fuzzy static uh, shape on my brush. Let's say I don't want it to be so drastically fuzzy. Um, this little bar right here, 100%, that is the amount of um, the, the amount that the uh, brush shape affects your brush. So change it to 50, and you can start to see that uh, fuzzy static lose its influence on your brush <coughs> to the point where it's just a minimal little, uh, like a little, little edge kind of a thing right there. So, let's switch it back to simple circle. And now underneath that is texture, right here. Um, and that is, it, it applies a texture to the brush you're drawing. It's like you're, you're like you're drawing on this invisible kind of, can like right here it says canvas. This one is paper. It's like you're drawing onto that material. And again, um, right here is 100% drawing on paper, 50 and less. You start to see it lose its influence. And if you want the entire page to be affected by that texture, or the entire layer, Click over here, make sure your layer is selected. Up here, paints, paints effect, uh, English translation. Uh, you can select this, and it makes it look like everything is. Yes, there's uh, several. Um, those <coughs> in the Onto Brush Pack, those different pencils are uh, the guy who made it, he made those to mimic the type of pencil. <coughs> yes, uh, pencil, pencil, grease, you know, paper, 2B, those are, are all um, geared towards imitating the pencil. Oh, you don't see pencil because I made pencil. Here, let me go over it again. Um, these are all my, the tools that I made, I keep on the bottom. Um, right click in an empty space select pencil and that will make a new pencil tool and there's your generic psi pencil right there and that's what um if you want to mess around with it um and again right click delete will delete all that good stuff um and you can name it if you really feel fancy um, let's name it pencil plane and um, stroke stabilizer, pressure stabilizer as well as shortcut key these are um, if you want a certain brush to behave a certain way uh, as far as stabilizer goes you can set it to where this will always act like it has an S1 stabilizer on it <coughs> And uh, it'll always have an S1 pressure stabilizer on it too, or uh, goes up to 15. Um, not specified means that your stabilizer up here will, you know, change it. And I, I think if you go past 
it, like let's say I have this set to 15, it'll I'll draw like. Yeah, I'll always draw like I have a, a 15 stabilizer on it, instead of, you know, a really quick like that, I get the kind of smooth lines. I think if you go over the, the set one there, like let's say S4, <laughs> nope, it doesn't override, so it's always permanently set to stabilizer 15. I don't like that so much. So, oh yeah, um, right here, canvas texture. Um, or paints texture right here. It says texture, let's say paper. Um, for this layer, you can see it has the word text next to it. That is the texture. Hang on. Um, so anything that I pick. Right here, I see I have simple circle, no texture set. Yet when I draw, it's going to have that paper texture on it. Um, and again, you know, 20%, 100%. That's how much the uh, texture affects it. So if you want something real subtle, then you know, do on the lower end. And also scale, it will, you can see the effects right scale is how big the texture itself is so 50% is like real tiny you know like that you get some huge kind of texture thing going on there oh I'm on S4 there's that and there's down to 50 you know it's just a lot of tweaking to find out what is what. <clears throat> okay. Whew. Um. Hmm. Is there anything anybody else wants to know about the like the pencil settings and stuff? Oh, quick resize. Yeah. Uh. Control Alt. Click drag. Does the quick resize which is the most helpful fucking thing on the planet, I think. Okay, now, go back to X. Um. Um. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> tablet keys are nice. Uh, I, I sometimes forget I have them, but... There, they're helpful. <coughs> okay, um, now for inking. Now we're gonna get to inking. Uh, f um, this is just me because I find it easier. It's like easy mode, sort of kind of cheating. Um, in that I use the binary pen, which is size equivalent of the pencil tool. As you can see, the edges are completely hard, you know, down to the pixel. Uh, and I do that because if I want to fill things in later by using the bucket tool, it will go all the way to the edge and fill that without any fuss whatsoever because if you use something like this hang on, if you use a, a pen I mean a pencil with a soft edge like that there's always the chance that you are going to end up with this you dreaded white pixels along the edge. And so you're gonna have to tweak the fucking stuff so it, you know, they go away and sometimes it's a pain in the ass and sometimes your uh, 
color, your fill color will overtake your line color, and it's just really fucking annoying, at least for me. Um, so, and, <clears throat> oh, I guess we can go over fill tool, uh, the bucket tool. It, um, you know, it does the, the color fill and, like, control F, except, you know, it does it in, uh, selected areas. Um, the, the, the edge hardness of the line, yes, that, that, those little four things right there, edge shapes, those determine how hard the edge of your, your tool is. Um, now, like, let's say we do this, we got kind of a soft brush like that, you know, it's kind of feathery towards the edge, if I fill, I get a way, you know, massive. Uh, line right there. Um, now the the bucket tool it has an option called transparency detection, which um, at the moment this black line is the only thing I have on the canvas. Everything else is transparent. So if I select transparency, um, it will fill in according to transparency instead of according to color. So you can see. It does a much better job. Fuzzy has more kind of a, a giving uh, edge to it in, in that you see it overtakes a little bit more. But um, the bad thing about transparency filling is that once you fill that, now that is all opaque, Th this entire circle is opaque, if you try and hit it again, you try and hit it again with a different color, it's going to overtake more to the point where my favorite phone, Twilight Spark, hands down. <laughs> but transparency fill works good the first time, not so good the second time. Um, which is why I like to use anti-aliasing for that, and I like to use the, um, binary pen tool so that I have solid edges and totally solid fills and I don't have to worry. And since you should be working at a very high resolution to start and size down later, those sort of hard edges will go away when you size down. They will feather out and smooth out so you don't have to worry. Um, so what I use is the binary pencil and the binary eraser. Uh, <coughs> Binary pen, uh, usually for sketching, just, you know, doing random ass picks, I do, uh, three or four thousand square, uh, pixel canvas at 300 dpi, and if I'm doing, like, commissions and shit, I do, like, seven thousand pixel square. <coughs> And then, you know, the end result is going to be a thousand or less in height or width. So it's going to size down and smooth out very nicely. And you don't have to worry about, you know, just tiny, tiny little things like the the hard edge on the lines. Um, okay, for inking, I'll, I'll go over the binary pen real quick. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, if you... You don't have one from the start, I don't think, inside. Or I mean, in the onto brush pack. So if you right-click on your empty area, you go down the binary pen. It's its own thing right here. Um, <coughs> a bi binary pen works different than a lot of other things. In that, obviously, the first is that it has a totally hard edge like that. But the other thing is that it doesn't blend. If you're on the same layer and you draw over it with a different opacity, it doesn't blend. 
So let's say I have this opacity goes from 0 to 255. Um, like let's say I have it halfway-ish. Inker regular. Inker regular. Okay. Um. Yeah, Inker regular. That's a very, very, very nice pen. Oh, uh, that's. Uh, he set it up. He, it's actually a brush. He set it up to mimic, you know, um, inking with, you know, a brush on paper, and it produces some very, very wonderful lines. But for this, I'm gonna be a lazy ass. A uh, femro <laughs> tutorial. People really want that. <laughs> I guess I could. <laughs> um. So uh, with <laughs> the binary pen, uh, it, it goes from zero to two fifty five for opacity. Two fifty five, totally opaque. Um, set it halfway ish. And I, you can see it doesn't blend. It overtakes this other color right here. So that is actually, um, here, let me, what the hell, there it is. Okay. So you can see right here that um the opacity of my brush you know it if I draw with like a slight uh, a, a more transparent brush over the top of this totally solid one it completely overtakes it which it's an interesting property of the binary pen but you can use that to your advantage because um, the binary pen inherently doesn't have an eraser and erasers there's really no way to get them to do an entirely hard edge as by default all erasers and sigh are going to do at least a little bit of this feathered edge right here so what you can do is I made two binary pens I called one pencil and I called one eraser I have the one called pencil set to 255 opacity gives me my black lines eraser I have it set down to zero and with the property of the binary pen that means that I will draw over this with transparency essentially erasing what I've done <coughs> so I love this for uh, inks because inks should be on a transparent layer if you know you're you want to edit them later and everything like that and it makes it it's absolutely fantastic because you, you get you know your solid edges and you get your solid edges for erasing so you don't have to worry about little fuzzies hanging around um i just find it very handy so now oh there it is there she is okay Now, I guess we can start inking. Hang on, let me see what I am for time. Jesus, I've already spent an hour on this stuff. Woo! Okay. Um, now, you're going to have people tell you about the stabilizer, that you shouldn't use the stabilizer, that it's a total, you know, crutch or something, you know, that it's bad. Um, it's bad in some cases but if you're doing something like inking by hand it's an amazing tool to use and you shouldn't be you know ashamed or afraid to use it because like if I'm gonna ink something I want them to be smooth lines you know if I'm drawing my hand and I'm not going to spend all fucking day redrawing redrawing no matter how hard I try at least I cannot get a straight you know perfectly smooth line so what I do is I usually just crank up the stabilizer just enough to remove the jitters from my hand so when I do a line 
I get absolutely no little bumps. <clears throat> yes, it mm, gets rid of that little white halo or those colored halos you get when you fill with the binary pen. Because it fills all the way directly up to the edge, exactly to the pixel. Also, it makes for insanely small file sizes. Like, I've done pictures that are like several thousand pixels wide with the binary pen only, and they get down to like kilobytes. Um, yes, like if you really, really want to practice and get all of your technique down to get perfectly smooth lines without the stabilizer, then that is fucking amazing, and I applaud you for doing that, um, but as you can see, I'm somewhat of a lazy ass, somewhat of a hack, and I use the stabilizer to smooth out my lines. Um, <laughs> oh, the tail with the stabilizer? Ah, that happens the higher you go. Like, let's do this up at like S6. You get that weird little kind of a tail going on. Oh, hang on. Because what it does is. Um, if you're using a stabilizer, uh, it slows down the actual tool following your stroke, so it does like it, it averages averages it. Like you can see, I think you can see my cursor. I hope I have it highlighted. You know, yellow. That on um, my cursor is very far ahead of where my tool actually is, so it doesn't catch all my jitters. Um, but like, let's say I draw this stroke and I I stop. I'm going to stop drawing, I'm going to pick up my pen, I'm going to pick up my pen when my tool is here. Like my actual stylus on the screen will be down here, but I'm going to pick up when my tool is about right there. So what you're going to get is, I let go here. I mean, I let go actually right here at the end of the line. That was my actual stroke. This right here is where my tool ended up. So what Psy does is it compensates. It takes this extra area where this is my actual location, this was the tool location, and it, you know, averages along that line which is why you get tails on your uh your inking pens <clears throat> and it's been going for an hour <laughs> it's been going for an hour and you missed um hell of a lot of uh just basic side tools and stuff i haven't really gone over <laughs> I haven't really gone over any, you know, like, actual art techniques. And no, you didn't miss the femur over thing. <sighs> Don't listen to Desil. I've only been going for an hour. Yes. Okay. So, um, that's the unfortunate side effect of, um, high, high stabilizers. Once you get in the S1 through S7, you start getting those tails when you draw. start getting those tails when you draw. Um, <coughs> the best way I can think to combat that is kind of hard in that let's say I'm at stabilizer S7 and I want to draw this line around her eye. Now if I go like that and I let go, you could let go and you, you get the hang of it and have it, you know, average and end up over there. Or I can draw to that point and hold my stylus down until my tool catches up with me. Ah, uh, that can kind of introduce, you know, if you get kind of jittery towards the end, you get a big blob or something like that. That's the best way I can think to get rid of tails. 
like right here if I were to go like that I get the, I get a line that I don't want so I, I do this and I hold and I wait until it reaches me uh, unfortunately that's just a side effect you're gonna have to deal with with a high uh, high stabilizer um, and I, there's really no good way around that Unfortunately, <coughs> so it's just a lot of practice to accommodate around, pretty much. Um, but yeah, okay, yeah, it's S, it's at S seven. Um, for me, usually, I've been kind of toning down my stabilizers. I used to use like. S4 and S5 constantly, but lately I've been going down to, I'm sorry, I'm really fucking hungry, um, I've been going down to like 10, maybe 12 for my stabilizer, so that I can get rid of the judos in my hand, that's what I want to, that's my entire purpose of using the stabilizer, is to get rid of those judos. Um, hmm. So I guess we can do a quick ink job and then color her and then all that good jazz. Um, and I guess I could use her for the shading tutorial. Yeah, I think I will. Um, so don't mind me. I'm just gonna fucking crank something out real quick. Shit. I'm a little extra shaky today, it seems. <clears throat> Performance anxiety. Too shaky. Off the tablets. Also, basic drawing technique. I said it in my last tutorial and I'm going to say it now. You should be, or should try to, draw with your entire arm instead of your wrist. Which, what I mean is... Uh, like here, I'm just going to draw a little circle right there. That, I... I don't rest my arm, I mean I don't rest my, my, my hand on the, the tablet and use my wrist because here's using just my wrist, you know, you get kind of a, you're basically you have to compensate for this, this angle that you put your, your stylus at because the further away you extend your stylus from um, your, your initial position you're gonna get kind of that, you know, it's really hard to explain why, but um, what you should basically be doing is um, moving your entire hand over your uh, tablet. And you can do that by either moving your upper arm, pivoting at the elbow to get strokes like that, or um, if you move your entire arm, like from your shoulder, you can like that's without a stabilizer getting you know a circle relatively looking like a circle like that um, this is um, resting my hand down and trying to draw it's it's a big difference and I've found it helps a lot in me getting the exact sort of uh, stroke that I want onto the paper the canvas the thing you know, it gets exactly what I want on there. Rather than, you know, getting, having to control Z forever.
And this is just going to be real super quick. Oh, and another thing. This is an interesting way to think about things. <coughs> uh, I'm going to use... Oh, fuck, I didn't go over the magic wand. Uh, magic wand is another way to select things. Um, it selects... It selects like um like the the paint bucket fills. It selects an entire area within, you know, like I'm right now. I, s I have it set to color difference. Um, you can set it to transparency difference, just like the bucket tool. Except instead of filling, it selects things. So um, right now I have it set to zero color difference, and I have anti-aliasing unchecked. So if I click there, this entire area is sealed off. Her horn is entirely sealed off. You're going to see the little highlighted blue, that's what I have selected, and it's going to be a hard edge. Hang on one sec. Okay, sorry about that. Anyways, where was I? Oh yeah. Um, if I have anti-aliasing checked on my magic wand tool, and I select, you can kind of see it's got a little bit of that fuzzy edge. got a little bit of that fuzzy edge there and now I don't want that since I'm doing all hard edges so there's that right there um I have my magic wand tool set to W double click on your tool set the shortcut key to W if you want that's what I usually do um the reason I'm going over this is because like <coughs> I uh, let's say I want to draw the fluting on her horn but I don't want to draw outside here. I just select that and you can draw inside that without having to worry. And conversely, you can select outside of her horn and you can draw her hair and not have to worry about that intersecting and messing up her horn. <clears throat> and now let's say I want to get her other ear, but I don't want to draw on her hair. Then I just select that, and there's that. Oh shit, that's way off. Okay, should be up here, kind of. There we go. Not thick enough. Fuck, that looks off. Sorry, guys. I'll deal with it in a sec. And again, um, <coughs> if you're having trouble with something, a certain area, uh, um, go to something else. <laughs> Don't pick at it until you know you're sick of it. You should just move on. Like I, I tend to do that a lot when I'm drawing hands. Because hands and feet are some of the worst things to draw ever. They're so... I don't even know. Something I need to practice on, that's for sure. But, um, you know, if I get sick of something, instead of picking at it until I hit it, I just move along. And, oh look, there we go again. Oops. There it is. We can draw the rest of her eye. Don't have to worry about 
coloring into her hair. Control Z. Everybody loves Control Z. Okay. That is how Lyra's hair looks right, right? I think. I hope. Colgate? Mmm. Let's go for Lyra. Reference time. <coughs> it is time for Minty Ponies. They do have the same hair? Hmm. I guess I never really noticed that much. I haven't looked well. It's kind of hard to picture them without the color. Ah, she has a little kind of a flippy thing going on here. I will get it. Two or three tufts of hair, aside from the white one, I think. Two. And yes, it is Marla. <laughs> like I said in the last stream, I try not to... Like, if I'm drawn for myself, then I'll turn on whatever the hell I want to listen to, which at some time, certain points might be dubstep. So I know that's not the most popular amongst everybody. So I try to go with soundtracks. Horrible daily drawing. I will be the judge of that. What are you talking about horrible daily drawing? <clears> huh, <throat> <laughs> yeah, I guess they do have the same. Hmm.
Uh, yes, I will be putting the sci file up. Sci file and the photo. Oh, thanks for fucking reminding me. Save everybody, save all the time. Like shit. I'm a horrible person. <coughs> save often. That's how I fucking jip you guys out of my shading on the last tutorial PSD because I didn't fucking save it last time. Sorry about that, by the way. If you wanted that shading, it sucked, but I'm sorry. Okay. That looks good enough. Pwn head. And smiley. Oh, forgot to take care of this. <laughs> Too bad, Klondike. I'm going over Fem Rover tutorial after this, which basically I guess means uh, I kind of show you how I draw her. Well, after this, quote unquote, being my regular tutorial. All the horrible things. Alright, now I just gotta finish fucking doing that here. Should be technically, should be here. Here ish. Damn it. Oh wow. <laughs> Could stand to be moved over there. In fact, when do we do that? Bridge of the nose. <coughs> Just say fuck it in that other ear. Actually, no, I'm going to do the good thing. And I'm going to. Uh, if you're having trouble, then the good thing to do is redline. Redlining means um, guidelines, like editing. A lot of the time people do it for someone else. Like, you know, you'll see people asking to be, you know, to have their stuff redlined. Um, So, just basic position of the ear should be there, and the other one should be about right here, if I'm looking. Yeah, I was right. Shouldn't be over here, should be over here. I do believe that I am finished with uh, inking. Now, um, 
uh, <clears throat> don't you don't have to worry about like right here. The final picture I imagine will be about like this. Right now. As far as cropping goes, I imagine the final picture will be like that. So I'm not necessarily worried about this little bit down here, but for the sake of filling things in, making it easier for me, I'm just going to take and kind of do that. So right now it looks like she's just kind of a floating head, but you know, if you if you have an idea of what your picture is going to look like in the end, you don't need to draw the rest of her. Like, you know, I could be like, oh, draw the rest of her body going over there. And, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, okay. Um, good thing to do um, to save your save your ass is um, to duplicate your inks. Uh, <coughs> and to duplicate them uh, inside, you uh, click and drag the layer over the little new layer icon and then it'll make a copy with parenthesis 2 around it. Um, I usually call these inks original or something like that and then these uh, ink fill which um, would be filling it in with the colors. Hang on. need a color ref for Lyra and I got it right here okay <clears throat> now I'm going to go with my wonderfully pixelated edges and my wonderfully hard edged bucket tool I'm going to go and I am going to just fucking attack and shit's gonna get colored in like five seconds. Oops, I forgot to draw the little line there for her hair. And yes, you do hear Marlin. Okay, and this is where <coughs> um, hard edges come in handy right there. I select that. It goes all the way up to the edge of the inks. And I'm going to select my pencil tool. I'm going to select her hair color right there. And I'm just going to go like that. Drawing that little bit. Actually, it should be technically more along. Okay, awesome. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Now I'm gonna go over something pretty handy for uh, doing stuff like eyes. I'm gonna do masks, which masking. Uh, masking. What masking does, it's like, uh, let's say you have a piece of paper and you cut out a circle in the middle of that paper and you place it over a picture. Uh, you're only going to see through that paper, you know, the hole that you cut in the center. That would technically be a, ma a mask. And it's, yeah, it's like a stencil kind of, sort of. Um, but what it does in, in uh, image editing programs is instead of, you know, this, this piece of paper or the rest of the stencil you have covering up this picture, it turns that completely transparent. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'll show it to you. Um, make sure you make a new layer for her eye. Her eyes. I'm going to call it eye color. Um, usually ponies have four eye colors. <coughs> They have the bottom of the iris, they have the top of the iris, and then they have the two highlights. Um, I'm going to only worry about the 
bottom and the top of the iris for the moment. Um, in in uh, the Anza brush pack, you should have a uh, you should have <coughs> what you call it a blending tool. That's it. Um, and I'm going to use those. So color it like that. Fill that in, and I'm going to fill in the rest with that. Now, it's a very hard edge you see right there. That is a okay. Okay, um, and I'll explain how to use the mask for shading later. Um, as soon as I get into shading, uh, I'll, I'll help you up with that. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the blending tool right here. Uh, usually I like blend clean because that one that blends the best. Um, Uh, blend clean. You can see the effects right here. Hang on, let me turn off the stabilizer. And I'm just gonna run over that quite a bit. You might start to see some of her eye color coming through, but that's because I didn't... I didn't cover my bases by, um, coloring, you know, Technically, I should have been coloring like way the fuck out there, but don't mind me. Um, and what? Now that you have that blended like that, what you want to do is um, you're going to take your magic wand, <coughs> and I'm going to select her irises right here out of your inks. And um, you should always reference your inks for selections. Um, because, you know, that's, those are the areas you want to fill, or you don't want to fill. Um, so right now I have our irises selector right here, and, uh, the way masks work is that it takes a selection and it turns it into that stencil. Now, I have, you can see right here, the selection is her irises with the little, you know, the highlight in there right there. Um, what I'm gonna do right here is click this right here, you can see that little stencil that deal new layer mask and it's going to use that selection for the mask and that takes care of that right away <coughs> um and you can turn on and off the mask like right here you see so it's really just like a stencil being applied over the top, making it, um, <coughs> blocking out certain things. Um, and, uh, you gotta be careful if, if you have a mask, because you have, right here is the mask, to the right, you can kind of sort it, barely see it, I can barely see it, but there's these two little white blobs right there, black is your stencil, white is the area that's gonna show through. If I'm s if this little box is surrounded by red, I am currently s uh, editing the mask itself. Right here, I am editing the layer. And you can kind of see, like, this little pencil right here, that means you're working on the layer. This means you're working on the mask. Um, you can add to the mask by using a regular pencil. Um, Uh, adding with the pencil will, you know, in increase the area that shows through, and hitting it with an eraser will decrease the area that shows through. If you ever need to make tiny little tweaks, you know, like, let's say, let's say right here, um, I actually, in my selection, I actually missed those few pixels. So you don't need to reapply the selection. You can just take a pencil, pencil tool, and uh, fill in the rest of your selection right there. 
Um, now, the selection seems kind of unnecessary, maybe, because I could turn the selection off and put this underneath. But, I'm just giving you uh, another uh, thing to use. I'll use it when uh, shading, <coughs> a little more in shading. But, um, it's a very handy thing to know because sometimes uh, masks will, you know, help you out with uh, a lot of things like uh, a lot of the time I do use it for their eyes like this coloring in the irises let's call that highlights and I'll hit it again okay so I do believe Lyra is all colored. Okay. Now we are going to get into um, shading. Let me put all of this stuff in. Just pull the ref out. Don't want that. Okay. So now here's my uh, too small. Ah. Well, that's, they are a little small, but that's how I do it. Like, if you want to be show accurate, then you're going to have the big honking ones that are like that. Yeah, that's just, it, it, it's all boils down to style. A lot of this boils down to style. <coughs> like, personally... I don't know. They could stand to be a little bit bigger. But usually I don't by default I don't um don't draw the huge huge ones. That's just me. Um Okay, now shading. Shading, shading. Alright. So, we're going to go with the typical, totally typical spheres and cylinders to start with. <clears throat> and lighting, a lot of lighting and properly portraying lighting depends on practice and observation. Um, <coughs> I'm going to fill these in with kind of a grayish. To start as a flat gray, like let's say that this is their flat color. Now, um, lighting, lighting all depends on the direction that it comes from, obviously. So, um, and uh, imagining how lighting works on something that you're drawing, because you're drawing on 2D surface, but you want to make something look 3D or like it would exist in 3D. So, um, a lot of that boils down to you um, thinking in your head how it would look in 3D. Now, it's easy to just um, go like this and say, oh, shade that, highlight that, and I'm done. But that's not always the case on how things look, um, because that might work for like one, one single direction, but it's, it's very not very interesting. Um, so what, let's say I want light to come from, okay, imagine this is a, this exists in 3D, this is going back, forward, right, left. Let's say the light is coming from this direction. Point down here, I guess. 
I want the light to be shining to this point. From it's fucking hard to explain <laughs> where light is coming from on a 2D surface when I want to make it look 3D. Um, basically, I want the light to be hitting this area of the sphere. Imagining it coming from there. So, <clears throat> with that, you're going to have the most intense point of light is going to be where the light hits. And it's going to kind of taper off from there. Um, and for the shadow, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine it, but the most intense point of, uh, the shadow is oftentimes, uh, it's like closer to the light, sorta. So, in fact, you'd, by, by default, you'd want to make this edge right here super super dark but in fact that is not the plane tangent to the light source yes <coughs> so um, the best advice I can give for lighting observing lighting is to take an egg take an egg and take it into a room that has a single light source one light bulb no televisions no nothing and to take pictures of that egg from various angles with the light hitting it at various angles it works I guess in a dark room with a lamp or something like that um, also colored lights if you have them or putting something in front of the light to make it colored also helps as well for you know seeing things Yes, interrogate the egg. Because the shadow will be in this area of the sphere, but I am not simply shining the light onto this object. From, uh, it's not simply just hitting this point. Uh, hang on. It's not simply just hitting here. And that's it. Light wraps around, so the light's gonna go around. It's gonna go around this edge as well. And it's going to hit around it, you know. You don't always have things floating in the middle of, you know, sp space, or if you're not resting on anything. So, you're going to have... a table, or some sort of surface, that this thing is sitting on. And light is going to hit it. It is going to be affected by it. So this light is coming down. And there's going to be a bit of shadow. You can kind of see it affected by the, the direction that, that um, I'm having the light come in from. So um, it's like a like a spear. You can kind of see this um, light piercing through the sphere, going all the way through down to here, that's the direction it's coming from, and so this, the shape is going to, like, like that, that's the, the width of the, the, <laughs> it's really fucking hard to talk about this sometimes, sorry guys, um, but, <coughs> Hmm. 
sorry, I never taught lighting before. I usually just do it and don't think about it, which is kind of hard to put into words. But, um, like I said, with the egg, if you have the egg and you're taking pictures of the egg, then you can see the, um, the way that the shadow, um, will fall onto the table or the surface that it's on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, make up words. And, um, the thing with this is, since the light is shining and hitting this and shining around it like that, light is going to hit the table that you're on. And since it's going to hit the table, light reflects and it is actually going to somewhat affect the shadow on the back of the sphere. So your sphere is not going to be shaded all the way up to the edge. Or at least the you know darkest shading is not going to be all the way up to the edge. You're going to get ambient light which, you know, the light wraps around, or the light reflects off of things, and it's going to reflect off of the table, and you're going to see it show up on the opposite end of the sphere. Um... I'm gonna do multiple layers of this. Um, now let's do that um, light hitting the cylinder from the same direction. Um, since this is a flat surface, it's going to mostly be, you know, lit up on the top like that. <coughs> and then you're gonna have it's coming from the same exact direction so coming down spearing through and this is going to be the point that is hit with the most light on the cylinder now um, the way you treat how the shading goes the shading appears on the uh, object itself, that can determine what the object looks like. I am not very good at that, but I know there's a, I've seen it flying around uh, a few times, is um, there's just this picture of uh, various cylinders, and it has these um, materials next to it, like if, uh, hang on, let me see if I can find that somewhere. It's fucking fantastic. It's got like maybe 20 different things on it. Um, and you can see how light affects those things. Like it has like metal, skin, grass, fur, and you can see how it affects that. Um, come on, Google. If anybody knows what I'm talking about and could find it, that would be amazing. Because it is such a helpful reference. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I'm actually going to put these each in separate little things. Okay. Alright, this will be for you guys later. Um, Alright, now, since the light is coming from here, hitting about right here, and illuminating along this edge is the part that gets the most light, right there. Um, since the light is coming down from an angle, uh, this, this cylinder's uh, the top will kind of look like that. So um, your shading won't just be, 
won't just be um like lines like this your shading is going to be more intense down over here it's not just going to be straight up lines it's going to kind of be like that ish um so let me turn that off so going to end up down there like that um again the shading is most intense tangent to the light source and you're going to get that ambient light coming through the back like that because when the light hits down go like that and you get the uh, light hitting over here and it's going to shine onto the table and it's going to hit over here the light's going to be hitting onto the table over here it's going to be reflecting and it's going to be creating that ambient light that hits the back of the cylinder right there like that so like I said a lot of this is boils down to imagination and imagining how these things look in 3D um, because that's shading one, and I'm going to do another. Um, where do you want to see the light direction coming from now? <coughs> oh no, I think I'm out of Morrowind. side luminescent spheres <coughs> okay top so let's do let's do our little thing like that again oh good I'm glad it's helpful because I'm really really I'm sorry about how shitty I am explaining with this because <laughs> like again, again like it's easy for me to you know blab about tools because I don't know it's all right in front of me you know and it's easy to blab about shapes in characters when you're drawing and stuff because I've, I think about that a lot but uh, I don't think about lighting I just do it and it's hard to explain <coughs> behind the object yes after this behind the object okay um, so now we're going for directly top down So, um, here. it's going to be hitting up here, and then you're going to, you know, the shading is going to follow these lines right here, and you're going to have, since it's coming straight from the top, from all sides, it's going to hit down and your shadow is going to be the exact width of your sphere like that. So there's that. Let's hit this with not 32, shading 2. Okay. Let me grab this color actually. And then okay. So now I'm going to take that off, and uh, we have our. Let me grab my highlight again. 
we have our highlight at the top. It's hitting directly at the top. And we're going to see that kind of fade out a little bit. And now, again, darkest point this is from off of the tangent. So um, you can see right here up and down in value. Oh, 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 sorry about that. Um, uh, it might be, hang on, let me see, right? Uh, by default in Psy, uh, right clicking, or no, I might have changed that, but right clicking should uh, grab a color for you. This right here, um, hang on, this right here is the eyedropper, color selector, color dropper, picker, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that tool selects the current color that you click. So like, let's say I want to click here, then I'm going to end up with that gray color. You can see it right there. And I click this, get that, click this, and I get the red. Um, and <coughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, like a lot of the time, uh, the pen uh, stylus buttons have a right click on it, which you can select the color like that. Or if you want a shortcut, Alt-click uh, alt selects it. That's usually what I use. Like, I have one hand on the keyboard, my left hand on the keyboard, and my right hand on my stylus. That's usually how I operate for Psy. Um, <coughs> so, um, Alt-click is the one I usually end up using. And that's how I'm picking the colors. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So now, you see, since the light is hitting shining directly down on top. You can see that on the way the light falls here, the light shines. It's hitting this and if the shadow is, you know, showing up on the table, it'll be a perfect circle. Since it's shining down directly from the top. Um oh keeping the same Oh, oh, yes. Uh, right here you have these two. This is your foreground. This is your background color. Um, by default, X switches the two. So sometimes you'll see me like, I'll grab this color, I'll grab this color. So now I have my light and I have my shade. Um, <coughs> like if you want to store one, that's how you do it. Otherwise, a good practice to do is um, to create a color palette for yourself. Like, look, technically I should be doing that. I don't know why I'm not doing that. Let me do that right now. Palette. You take something, 100% density. Oops. Damn it. There it is. Okay. So now that's my uh, standard shape color. This is my standard highlight color, my standard shade color right there, and here's my table color. So now I can select from those anytime that I want, that's good practice. Okay. Wait, what did you miss? I might be able to go over it. Okay. Yes, this is getting recorded. Start the stream over? Sure, <laughs> sure, guys. Okay. So you see the. Uh, the way the light is falling down 
<coughs> and it, it's uh, the tangent of the, the, the light source is uh, along these edges right here, the very edges of the sphere. That's where your shadow is going to. Oop, wrong tool. Here, that's what I want. This is the tool that I want. Right along here is where it's going to appear. What do you think about that Dear Esther game? <laughs> yeah, I was at uh, I was at GDC when they did the uh, the independent game boards and stuff, and Dear Esther won so many things and. Yeah, I don't know. I might give it a shot, but to me that doesn't seem like that cool of an idea for a game. And yes, this is a lighting tutorial. Um, yes, this is a custom dealy that I made. Uh, it's my sketching brush. It's pretty much my all-purpose brush that I use for nearly every game thing. Um, settings for it, uh, uh, I made a new brush, I usually keep it around 50% opacity, um, I have the shape on it, onto the rectangle, or any other hard square edge, uh, 100%, and, uh, for the blending, dilution, and persistence, 25, 0, 20-ish. <clears throat> it makes it for a nice kind of a blending, kind of a smudgy brush. <clears throat> but you're gonna see the hardest edge of that be right around there. Light, you're gonna have the shadow from the light source. It's gonna be down around right here. And uh, the ambient light, the way that affects the sphere, is that it's going to, the light's gonna hit the table, and it's gonna reflect. <laughs> no, I'm not doing the stream over. And so you're gonna see this kind of a like a stripe. Cause it since it goes all the way around, you're gonna see it all the way around. Shading from the top down is kind of hard since it's not always used. It's very, very rarely used and as far as drawing this go. <clears throat> Hang on one second, guys.
Alright. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, yeah, like I really I really wanna play Journey. Like after from what I've seen. I really wanna play Journey. There's I don't have a PS3. I've been not holding off on buying it, but just mm, haven't really saw many, much reason to buy it. But this, the, the group of games that I want to play that is only on PS3 is steadily growing, and so I might have to finally break down and get one. <coughs> but anyways, yeah, top-down shading is kind of hard to portray, at least on things that you'll see it'll be a little easier on uh, the cylinder <clears throat> okay now for the cylinder Okay, now with how the sh light is hitting the cylinder, it's going to be hitting the top, so the top is going to be completely illuminated. Um, and like with the sphere, the light's going to be hitting it like this. And actually, technically, the light source is hitting at multiple, since it's since light is a radiant source like this, unless you have some severely, you know, directional light. It's going to be like that. Um, and so, the light is going to hit, since the source is right here, that's going to be the most extreme line, but then you're going to have it go out like that. Um, and with the cylinder, there is no concave, you know, it doesn't go under like that like the sphere does. So when the light hits down like this, you're going to have, uh, you know, there's, there's not going to be any shadow underneath. But, um, the way the light goes like that radiates, you know, from the top like that. You're going to have a slight bit, which is the tiniest bit darker there, but not much. It'll be negligible. Um, so, let's grab our colors. And since the top is going to be totally illuminated, we can just color that and don't need to worry about it anymore since it's getting hit with the most light. Okay. Alright, so that's top down. So what did we want from there? Back? Chitting from the back. <coughs> um you could 
could use the blend tool. I, for one, kind of like this little stripey painty thing you get going over here. But um, you can get various blend tools that can help. Uh, I could do like a wet blend like that, and you can kind of smooth out the sphere to get more of a natural shiny look to it. But, you know, like I said, I like, <coughs> I like, yeah, the knife blend is nice, because the, the knife blend and the uh, squeegee blend get, um, <laughs> they get, um, you know, the, the wide flat blending going on, which I like those, but then again, that's just down to style. Ooh, nice. Hey, a razor. Um. Yeah, Alpha Bloom. That. That um is a. Uh, good example of. Stretch. Because there's stretch and there's squish. Or squash. I'm not entirely sure what the term is. Um. You'll see Rose use that a lot. Like I'm just starting to get the hang of it. But, um, like as far as cartoony characters go, you have, where is it, here, you have, you know, you have your standard, then you have your stretch, and then you have your squish. Um, it's fun to use, and it's fun to think about how to use it. I'm just starting, you know, <coughs> to get the hang of it. We want light from behind, I think. <coughs> I think that's what we wanted. Directly behind or like at an angle? Like, um, we could do like according to this my little my little cross again. If you want it coming along this line, so it'll be it'll be at an angle, like and the light will be coming from there, or do you want it coming from, this is the center, this is what I'm looking at, and the light is coming directly at me. Okay. <clears throat> My angle is a little easier, There's a lot easier to, to show. So light will be going like this, directly from behind. So, since the light is coming from there, it's going to affect the sphere like this. Um, hmm. So, let's see. Dang, there we go. And I am going to apply all this later to Lyra. Um, uh, and I'll do a few, maybe two different angles. Okay, yeah, I'll go over that, applying to an actual picture because... <clears throat> oh, but don't discount these shapes. You should practice on these shapes. Because um, you can find these shapes within uh, actual pictures and actual figures, you can find it. Um, like the, the head of ponies, pretty much a sphere with um, their snout, it could be kind of like a rounded cone on the top, so if you treat those two as, you know, intersecting, you can think of it that way. Um, and that helps a lot with drawing too, breaking stuff down into shapes that you recognize and you can replicate and build up from there. 
built with shading, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of similar. And the things that throw you off are like hair. Hair is usually a big one that throws people off. Yeah, well, I'm perpetually stuffed up, so. <laughs> and all this talking is not helping, but it's okay because I'm helping. I am helping. Okay, so the light is coming from over there. Um, let me get this. And the light's gonna bend around it like this. And it's really... Ah, shit, I wish there was an easier way to show this. Yes, Apple Bloom, that is exactly correct. Exactly. Just... If... if it's, it's easier to... Um, picture things in small chunks or small recognizable shapes and go from there <clears throat> than it is to imagine the thing as a whole. No! <laughs> it's totally okay. This one is kind of interesting to think about this. Hmm. And it's good to practice, like, I usually don't practice this, this angle that light comes in at. It's an unexpected angle. That usually, you know, if the light's going to be coming from above, or it's going to be coming from, <coughs> you know, below. The light coming from below, that's, that's a tough one, but it's pretty much an exact, you know, flipped on the y-axis of lighting from the top. So it's, it, it practices. Practicing helps quite a bit, obviously. And now, um, the highlight is going to be behind the ball. We can't really see it. So I'm going to be just using something like this. Just barely able to see it there. Um, here's our table. Uh, yes, I'm going to apply this to Lyra after I finish this and the cylinder. The cylinder will be a little more interesting as far as this lighting comes. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get the ambient light yet. Um I was just gonna do the shadow real quick, so it's kinda hmm. Huh. Shadow would be minimal since it's coming from directly behind. So you wouldn't get much. You just get a very tiny bit. Um, and then the light's going to be hitting on the table. And you're going to be seeing it mostly from the bottom, like that. <laughs> yeah, you pretty much missed. Uh, pretty much all of it. I will admit that this is definitely not the best one that I have done. In fact, it is the worst one. But that is a-okay by me.
Yeah, this since we can't see the highlight and we're only seeing the shadows, it's kind of hmm. It's not a very good one that you'd want, but especially for like a sphere. Like it would work better on a character <clears throat> because you know the the character's you know arms and you know things will be they'll be composed of like cylinders and they'll show up a little better than the spheres. But um, yeah. Like, this is not not a good angle for spheres, but it's decent enough, I suppose. Um, okay, now for the cylinder. Okay. Cylinder. Light again is coming from here. It's going to be, oh shit. That's what I want. There. It's going to be hitting it. And um, it's going to be wrapping around it in that fashion. <coughs> and this is the soundtrack from uh, Res, actually. Hmm. shadow is going to be much more significant. <clears throat> Ooh. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, those are good references for different materials and stuff. Like, honestly, shading shading metal is probably going to be the fucking hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. At least it was for me. Shading chrome, like, oh good lord, I hate it. I hated it so much. There's so many reflections off of reflections, and it's just, it's ridiculous. But I guess if you're a masochist, that's a good study for shading. dog in there somewhere. <coughs> Alright, so the tangent to it again will be about here. Um same similar to the uh, sphere up there. Um he, again since we're not seeing where the highlights coming from that's kinda I don't like that as much but it's not so bad. It's not giving a direct source of light. It's not. It's not going to be highlighted yet. It's not going to be too shaded. It's going to be slightly so. 
since it's not, it doesn't have light shining directly on it, and it's just a flat. You know, it's not getting, uh, it's not getting a reflection from the ambient light at all, <coughs> so it's not going to be lit up very much. Um, and then with the, the reflection off of the table, and we get the ambient light. We're going to get a little bit. Sorta. This could be a stand to be a tiny bit darker. There. Okay. Well, as you can see, the back shading doesn't offer for very interesting looking stuff because you you you're removing the. Uh, the highlight entirely. You're not getting the highlight aspect of it at all. Like that. You're just getting the shadows. And it's not... That wouldn't be first on my list of things, you know, to choose for, for a direction of lighting. Uh, because since these are just the simple shapes, if you had um, more complex shapes like characters or ponies and hair and stuff like that, then you could possibly get some highlights in there from reflections and things like that. But now that that is over, shading is over, Lyra is back, we will bring Lyra back. Now, um, I'm going to be using masks again, and this time I'm going to be using masks for shading. Um, I want to shade her entire form, so I'm going to select everything but her, right here. And you see there's, uh, it's really kind of hard to see, that that little, the, the edge of the selection is right along her outside line. Um, since I want to make sure that the shading fills, you know, it, the shading covers her, but does not go outside of her lines, Oh, no problem. Um, since uh, I don't want the shading to go outside of her lines, I'm going to go in selection and I'm going to increment. I'm going to increment two or three times since my lines are pretty thick. Um, and you can see that the shading, I don't know, the, the selection has crept inwards a little bit. You can see it easier with uh, the magic wand. You see the shading has crept inwards a little bit like that. And now, that ensures when I invert, selection, invert, I'm selecting all of her, but I am not going outside of her lines. So there is all of the Lyra, and I'm going to make a new one called... <coughs> Okay, and I'm going to apply the mask, since this is the selection that I want, all of the blue. And then there we have that. So now, um, to show you that it worked, I'm just going to grab a color. Oh, shit. See? I made a mistake. I was selecting on the mask. I, ooh, I did control fill, and it filled the entire mask in with the color, which means it's entirely white, which means it's entirely negates the purpose of a mask, so make sure you're selected on your layer. And I'm going to fill that with a color, and there you can see, there was our mask. And actually that is what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be filling her in entirely. Um, One sec. Alright, never mind. So, I am going to, um, the shade layer? What? Oh, how do you mean? Oh, the, the sphere shading and stuff? Like this one. Should I 
shading, shading, shading. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Does anybody know how the multiply uh, property works in uh, image editing programs? Because I'm going to be using multiply very soon. <coughs> way to show how multiply works is by hmm. here um I'll turn off her colors and I'll do the shading I'll fill in the shading okay um now what multiply does is um it treats any instance of white in a color as transparent, which means on here on the bar, this is about half, you know, halfway to white from black. Um, the more you add, so like, if I fill this in with white, right here and I switch it to multiply it's going to be totally transparent but if I go down it's going to be only slightly transparent you know and it goes less and less so uh, you know the more black you add the more uh, opaque it becomes but um, that doesn't just apply to you know grays it can apply to like this, right here, just colors like that, um, and the thing is that, um, since it's called multiply, it treats, it treats, um, the, the, the white within the color as transparency, which allows it to be placed on the top of another color, so, um, like, let's say, underneath this, I have, Hang on, let me change this to normal. Turn that off. Testing. We will change this to some sort of blue. Okay. I'm just going to draw some scribbles. Now, um, when I change this to multiply, it's going to, um, treat the white within it as transparency which will allow the like <coughs> it'll allow the black to, to um, shine through but it'll it'll also um, darken this color right here like let's grab that color let's grab this color as a comparison between the colors this is regular this is with uh, that kind of uh, pinkish hey iris this is with that uh, that, that pinkish on top that um so I if you like subtract that that pink color from here you're gonna get this blue color and uh, the way that this works in shading is that um, you can have this, this base color, this base color of, you know, it could be just a gray to, to shade, and I'll do that at first as just an example. I'll do it right now, actually. Let's do some sort of gray, and we'll turn on these, her colors. You can see that they are kind of darkened a little bit. <coughs> But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a brush, okay, whichever brush you want, and I'm going to grab white. And since white is transparent, the more that I paint on top of this with white, 
the more that her original colors are gonna shine through. And now, it just, oops, shit. For a real quick run through, this is just gonna be, you know, really, really shitty shading. Um, I'm gonna be doing it from the top left. And so you'd have some sort of light hit her about like there, right there. And um, I'll go over definitely more in depth about how to do this. But there's some very, very extremely basic shading. She's extremely minty. <laughs> but that's this is how I'm going to be shading. I'm going to be um, I'm gonna be slapping a color over the entire thing. Uh, and it's going to be this kind of like this this grayish, you know, it'll, it'll be a color for the shadow. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be painting the white on top of it so that I will be painting the highlights. And um, this is similar to what Rose does, because I'm actually just, this is me stealing it from Rose. <coughs> I haven't really messed with it a whole lot. So this ought to be a learning experience for everybody, but I really like the way her ends, ends up. Um, so I'm going to clear that layer. Um, now, since she is entirely green, she's all shades of green, uh, something like a, a green or a blue color would work well. So I'm going to, and this is just like me bullshitting on color theory. Like, you could have... this like this is just straight up gray shading and that's with the blue shading you can see that it kind of adds a bit more to it than like I I'm not too big a fan of solid gray shading like here um this I'm not too big a fan of that but if you because because it's just all you're doing is you're, you're putting gray you're putting grays on top of colors which is just it's like moving it's like taking color and moving up and down here like that's all you're doing um but um if you add a color here you start to get uh colors getting mixed in like like you can see that instead of Instead of just, hmm. <laughs> we'll see you later. Thanks for watching. But um, like, ah, oh God, it's hard to explain color theory because I'm so horrible at it. But let's call me this in right here. Okay, now you can see the difference. Here we have the blue shading over here. Here we have the gray shading. The gray shading just kind of looks kind of like a dull version of the green. But when you have the blue shadow right here, it kind of makes the color more vibrant and it makes it more interesting to me at least. I think. Um, paraphrase color and light. Jesus Christ. This is like this is the area that I'm least experienced in. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the area that is that I'm least experienced in. Um so it's very hard for me to um say what I'm doing. Because, uh, like this this is this is into like color theory realm which is horrible for me.
And what I'm explaining right now, trying to explain, is how to create interesting shading, pretty much. <coughs> and now, um, like, let's say this color, this color will be your, your, your shadow color. Let's say you want there to be an ambient light that's more like a purpley. <clears throat> then you can put that over there like that. Kind of the other ambient light is coming from this other direction over here. We will blend all this crap together. So And when we hit on the multiply, you can see the slight gradient. Alright, have fun and no spoilers for me, please. See you later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, like, this is the part, oh yeah, no problem, see you later. Uh, this is, this is the part where I have the most fun with, honestly. I, I like playing around with stuff like this, just kind of messing with colors. And, um, no lighter. I guess as you can see I'm picking different different things to kind of bring out different colors. Cause there's gonna be you're gonna end up with some inevitably horrible color combinations. Like red on green, you're gonna end up with nasty, shitty looking colors. So, um, right here, this is <laughs> what I have right now. These are gonna be my shadow colors. Okay, so um, basically what we're going to be doing is we have all our shadows here. She is totally in shadow right now, our, our version of shadows. And what we want to do is we want to add some light to her. So where should the light come from, do you think? Because I could do shadows from any direction you want, really. We'll see how that works out. And... Hmm. <coughs> Let's try... Shadows from directly to the I mean, lighting coming from directly from her left. That should be interesting. So now, um, you can see that her, um, her head is, uh, like a sphere shape. Her eyes are gonna be kinda like elongated ellipsoids in shape. Um, <clears throat> her snout is kind of like a spherical bump on the sphere of her head. 
horn is very obviously a cone. Her neck is a kind of a curved cylinder. So we can apply those things to what we learned before in that <clears throat> um, since the light is coming directly from the left, her head is going to have the darkest shadow right along this curve of her face, pretty much like that. Um, so the way I try and do it is I try and hit the points that the light hits first. Um, and at first it's going to hit her nose right about here. It's going to hit her head right around here. It's going to hit her neck there-ish and the horn right along that line there. <coughs> so I guess work from the light source towards the shadows. You know what I'm saying? Um, and her snout. We have that there. Um, and this is going to be more like a cartoony looking shading, I'm not going to be going for the exactly realistic shading. So her, her snout is going to be entirely high, highlighted right there. Um, and since the snout area right here is kind of a bump, we'll see a little bit of shadow appear towards the bottom of it, where her mouth is. in the light and so is this it's going to kind of merge together <clears throat> and a lot of this again is just practicing practicing on how your light falls on your objects. And here's where you, you hit tricky things, is um, like right in this area. Um, because her, her snout is bumped along the sphere of her, uh, her head. So this point right here will stick out the most. It will create a slight bit of shadow here, but we may still see some color resume over here. So you may get a little bit of shadow along like that. A slight bit. from the left, going this direction, um, her hair is going to create a bit of a shadow along her, um, her head. So this area right here will actually be in shadow, and you'll start to see the light come right along here, and, uh, here's the bridge of her nose, so that's going to get the most light. There's going to be a tiny bit of shadow along this edge of her eye socket. So there's that. And 
I'm gonna smooth this out later. Like, I'd be doing this a lot more frantically where I'm not explaining it. And um, I'd be using my, uh, my blending tool a lot. <clears throat> so we're gonna see, uh, this right here is going to be from her, her hair is going to be casting this little bit of shadow here. And so we'll see the eyeball get hit with the light right about there. And kind of fade a little bit like that. So she's starting to step into the light is what it's looking like. Awesome. <laughs> I like that expression on the... I didn't put those in my bag. That's awesome. Okay. Um... And with the horn... The way that the horn works... Is that we're gonna have this central bit of highlight that comes along here, along the segments, and this one's going to be slightly in shadow a little bit, but what you're going to see is, uh, you can treat the horn, line, the lines on the horn as if she has, you know, ridges on her horn, um, and the bottom of the ridges would not receive any light, so technically, we should be doing this. I'll start from the bottom, or from this area. So, we have that bit of a highlight here. And leave that little bit, that tiny little bit right there, in shadow. Because that is beneath the ridge of the fluting of her horn. Um, Anyways, um, with the cylinder, or I mean, this is a cone, it's kind of like a, a cylinder that's brought to a single point on the top, um, <coughs> the edge that the light is going to hit, you know, you're going to see the shadow start here, so um, this is going to be in the most light, and you're going to kind of taper off a little bit there. Horns are interesting because technically they're, they could, I guess they could be shiny if you want them to be shiny. Um, and so that makes for some interesting lighting if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, okay, now we can get her ears, this ear. It's kind of like a very oddly shaped cone. And again, we have that ridge where the uh, shading starts. <coughs> and again, here's the curve of her ear that gets hit by the light. Get a 
have a little bit of shadow there for the inside of her ear. Actually, no, that's incorrect. Technically, it should go like this. You get that bit. This one is this bit, I think. Don't hold me to this. This is ears have always been a little bit hard for me to imagine how they're they're lit correctly. Cause their ears are like normal ears are a lot flatter, thinner. And so it's not so hard to imagine where it might fall on real horse ears or animal ears. I'm leaving the hair out because I'm debating whether or not I want to make that actually look like hair. Uh, because there are certain brushes within the Anta brush pack that um, mimic hair, and they mimic it very well. So um, I'll see about that in a minute. But for now, for now I'm going to do her neck, and this is where she gets hit with the light the most. And again, right about here is where it stops. And here is like a merger between a cylinder and a sphere. Ears, I 
think I messed up her ear. But that is okay. Okay, now we can do her hair, I suppose. Whew. Uh, let me try. Uh, it's towards the bottom, it's called Fur Course. And then there's also a fur smudge, which is a, um, a blending tool that uh, mimics the hair. But um, for now, first, for course, it's like a paintbrush. And what I'm going to be doing is going to be painting where the light hits. Right up here. Here's where the light hits. And it hits here as well. Mm-hmm. Let me actually save. So I can go back if I hand it. It's going to be hitting. Hmm. Damn. I may have wanted to have separated the hair on a different layer, but that's a little too late for that at the moment. Um. Uh, as we can see from the way her horn looks, and uh, you know, there's this shadow right here that her her hair sticks out a little bit in front. So this right here is going to receive some light as well. And right here, the light should be able to reach her hair a tiny bit. East, right about there. Probably with the lightest point being right there. But it'll be minimal. Um, and right here, this is where the backlighting will come into play. As we see light, we see light wrap around. Light wraps around stuff. It doesn't just hit it like a flat, you know, thing. This is, she's a 3D object. She's real. And we're going to make her look like she's real by making her three-dimensional. And actually, it went a little too far there. Should have only hit there. <laughs> and there is the Lyra. Whoa, whoa. Okay. How long has it been? Three hours. It's not too bad. It's better than five. Okay. Um. Okay, let me go back to the settle my color and neck looks too much. Okay, um, and now what I would do is I would make, oh, let's take a look at it in normal version. That's freaking creepy. But yeah, <coughs> what I've been doing is I've been painting the white on top, and I've been uh, leaving the colored areas that we have, we've been leaving them in the shadow. And I'm going to take uh, probably blend knife because I like the way that one looks the best. I'm going to be using that to smooth out a few things here. Because I wasn't entirely happy with how 
my tool worked. I could have used a different tool, but. And, uh, if you don't get it right away, just practice this because, uh, this, yeah, this is a very, it's a different way of imagining how shading works. Very different. And there's no good way or one way to approach these things because, like, just do whatever works for you because that's what it's all about. Just, like, the, you're not making a product on an assembly line. You're, you know, you're creating art. And so you, that's what you should do. You should just kind of roll with it and do your own thing. Make it your own thing. <laughs> Inspiring words. Okay, and now I'm going to use the fur smudge to hopefully make her hair look a little bit better. Did you get the Anta brush pack? Because it's in it. It's it's located in the uh, the bottom set of tools, or at least that's how it ended up for me. Okay. Right now I'm using fur smudge, but when I did the painting of the the highlights, I used fur coarse. You didn't? You should have. Huh. Well, hmm. like, did you, you did you follow the instructions where it said to run side start side.exe? I think it was. Okay. Hmm. That's odd. That's really weird. Damn, sorry. that's good. Don't know about you guys. I like it though. <coughs> Brush pack is very helpful. It has a lot of things that are very useful like the, the hair and the stuff like that. Um, actually, you know what? I think she might look good with 4chan blue. I think. <coughs> Alright, so um, that's it for that. Uh, is there any other 
stuff you need to know about shading and things because I'm going to uh, I'm gonna end this I'm gonna end this tutorial now and then I'm going to work on that fem rofer thing I guess after I start back up in you know a minute after I stop so I just want to make this you know like a self-contained thing um so yeah is there anything else No problem. Hey, hey. Yeah, I said I'd do film over after this. <laughs> <laughs> Shade those shapes, do that practice, shade them things, and then shade the ponies. Alright, let's finish her off actually. <coughs> Crop. Um, I covered shading, a lot, a lot of shading I covered. Oh, perspective, yes, I can do perspective and film river shit when I start this up again. <coughs> but if anybody, if we don't have any more questions about shading, then I might end this soon. Um, and as you can see, I, I resized it, and those hard-edged lines, that's what happened. They sized down and they got all nice and smoothed out. And so you don't have to worry about that at all. It fixes itself pretty much. Uh, Okay. Alright, well then I do believe that is that. For this, and I will shut this down um, to save it, and I will start back up again right away. Actually, I'm gonna get, like, food real quick, and then I'll be back. So, like, five minutes. So, Alright, uh, thank you guys for coming, watching, sticking around, and asking questions and all that stuff. <clears throat> so I will see you in a little bit.